of this the important concept in this Nobel Prize Award research. Okay, so yesterday it was awarded that the Nobel Prize in Physics of 2022 goes to these three gentlemen for experiments with entangled photons establishing the violation of Bell inequalities and pioneering quantum information science. Do you understand what he's talking about? Maybe it looks like you don't understand. But at least, yes, you know entangled photon. And there's only one more step to understand the rest. What is the meaning of the violation of Bell inequalities? Okay, so today I want to talk about this. And you will find that you already know a lot of things that enable you to understand the basics. Let's review what we did for entanglement before, right? And here, I, I am a very good in advertisement. Now I put the QR code. You will go to the video that we learned about entanglement earlier, right? If you forgot about it. We say that, for example, here, can anyone explain to me what is this? This is a, how many qubits? Two qubits, right? Because we see that it is written in this way, and it has four basis states. In this particular case, I have one state, which is a linear combination of this four basis state. And I tell you that this one, we can factorize it so that it becomes a tensor product of the uh, states in each of the subspace. The space of the electron one and the space of electron two, right? And now you understand what is a tensor product. It's just like a multiplication. But basically, this system, which has two electrons, can be described individually by the properties of this individual space, which form, which then go through the tensor product. Right? That is okay, right? We also talk about entangled states. For example, this one is one of the entangled states we learned before, one of the so-called Bell states, right? This is the psi minus. Here it has the linear combination of two of the basis states in the two qubit space, zero, one, and one, zero. Because of this, no matter how you do it, and no matter how you transform the basis or coordinate, you cannot factorize it into two subspace tensor product, a simple product of two subspace states. Okay? And this is called entangled state. We have learned this before. Any questions? What is the problem of, not a problem, what is the properties of entanglement? For example, it can lead to so-called EPL paradox, right? We have details here you can review again. The Einstein, Polosky, and Rosen paradox. Why is that? Suppose I have two electrons. I prepare them in an entangled state. This is the Bell state, right? Compared to my previous slides, I was, show, I was showing uh, another entangled state, which is 0, 0, plus 1, 1. Here I show 0, 1, minus 1, 0, doesn't matter, it's still an entangled state. I then carefully separate them to very far away, 100 night years away. Basically, you cannot communicate within 100 years according to special relativity, right? I do it carefully so they are still entangled, means the whole system of the, which composed of these two electrons are still entangled and described, still dis described by this wave function. Then I see it's decided to do a measurement on the first electron. I measure in the zero one basis, right? Or in our language, maybe the magnetic field is pointing in the Z direction. I measure the energy. When you do the measurement, the wave function collapse. Because this is in a superposition, it may collapse to zero or one. We have 50% of getting zero, right? Assume that we get zero for electron one. Then the whole wave function will collapse to zero one. I have uh, some typo I forgot to change. First of all, this should have the bracket and this is zero one instead of zero zero, 
should be zero one because my example last time was zero zero. It will collapse to zero one, right? Why? Because the whole system is a linear combination of zero one and one zero. If my first electron collapses to zero, then the whole system's wave function must collapse to zero one. I cannot collapse to zero zero because I don't have the zero zero component, right? And because of this, what will be the value of the electron 100 year, light years away? It will be one, right? And that is why the system now is at zero one. That's no problem, right? Of course, we talk of the spooky action at a distance, but we say that that doesn't violate uh, special relativity. We don't worry about that. But we do have the so-called EPR paradox. What paradox is this? If I get zero here, I can tell my friend who is 109 years away, although it takes many hundreds of years to tell my friend, but I can tell my friend that I have zero, so my friend knows that I also know that the electron too must, at one, must be at one state, right? It must be at one state. So I'm 100% certain this is at one state without measuring it. My friend did not touch the electron. But we already know that it is in one state. But then my friend decided to measure in the plus minus basis corresponding to have the magnetic field in the x direction. Then it will collapse to either plus or minus. Right? So as a result, for example, let's say it collapsed to plus. Then it also means that my friend is 100% certain the electron is in the plus state, right? For these details, you can also take a look in the old video, right? If you forgot why, we can have plus because uh, one is a linear combination of plus and minus, right? One equal to one over square root two, zero uh, uh, plus uh, one, right? So what does it mean? I'm 100% certain it is in one. At the same time, we are also 100% certain it's in plus. That violates the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. That is the so-called EPR paradox. We only stopped here last time in our class, right? And I thought that we are not going to tell, talk about Bell inequality. But because of the Nobel Prize, we should continue because you will see that you are so close to it. Now, how do I explain this paradox? To explain this, why it violates the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, we can say, well, there's something called long, long locality. Maybe the measurement of electron one affects the measurement of electron two. Somehow when I measure electron one, it sends a signal to electron two right away due to some physics. And it needs to be faster than the speed of light. It does it instantaneously, which then prevents Okay, yeah, I don't know what's going on, but you can see it now. Okay, it then prevents electron two from being measured in plus minus spaces. Okay, it has some mechanism, become the, then the measurement becomes invalid. This is possible, right? So this is one explanation. But this will violate special relativity because you need to transmit signal faster than the speed of light, right? So we choose not to believe in this, but who knows in the future, maybe someone came up with a better theorem. But at this moment, we feel this is really spooky, okay? Long locality is what you usually see when we talk about this uh, bells inequality or whatever. They try to want to say everything interact with each other locally, right adjacent to it. So it means you need to propagate the signal throughout the space slowly. Okay. Another possibility is to say quantum mechanics is incomplete. So while we are talking about all these states, it's not a complete description. It is incomplete. There are some hidden variables to describe the state. But we just still don't know them yet. We are not smart enough. We still don't have the theory 
to describe it yet. But maybe there's some hidden variable. And that's why you have this paradox. What does it mean? It means that when you generate this electron hole pair, it already has some thing imprinted. People call it DNA. Imprinted in these two electrons. They have an extra variable telling it that if you if this electron is up, the another electron must be down. For example, we will say the electron are actually not in superposition, right? That's what Einstein prefer. Like when I don't look at the moon, uh, the moon is still there. This is called realism. Whether the, the state of the object is independent of my measurement. Now you say it's in superposition. I claim that it's just because you don't know it well. It is not. It has some hidden variable. It's not because I look at it, then it collapses to zero or one. That is one thing. And also, it can be fully described by the hidden variable. For example, electron one can be in one of these states. Look at this. Instead of at zero and one, or superposition of zero and one, electron one is definitely in zero plus a hidden variable, which is plus or zero plus a hidden variable, which is minus. Okay, it's in one of these states. This is a one qubit state. I'm not, I'm not talking about two qubit. One has zero and one has plus. I just say that this electron, while we see is zero, actually is zero plus one, a hidden variable plus there, right? But we just, our quantum mechanics just not good enough to describe it. We cannot, we are not able to describe the, find out the uh, hidden variable yet. Similarly, the electron two can be in this two state, this four state, right? So for example, when I prepare electron in zero and one, then they are in this blue group, then you, you might have a first electron at zero plus, second electron at zero at one minus, then uh, you just let them uh, go to two different places. Then when I measure the electron, I get one, I get zero, then the other one must be one. And also, or maybe it was prepared at the green pair, pair. When I got electron one equals to one, then the other one must be zero because it's be predetermined, just like a graph. I have blue and yellow, I put them together. If you get yellow, I must get blue. You get blue, I must get yellow. And in addition to that, I also have some hidden variable. And you see that I have 50% of the chance to get plus or minus if I measure in the plus minus basis. This is not the quantum mechanics we have been learning. So don't feel confused. Say, try to map to what you are learning. Okay. So this is the summary. If both measure in zero one basis, right? Uh, uh, the one on earth, the, the one on uh, 100 night years away, you will always get opposite. You get zero, electron two get one. If electron measure to be measure electron one measure to be one, electron two will be measured to be zero. But if people choose to measure in plus minus basis for electron two, no matter in which cases, I have fifty percent of chance to get plus or minus. This kind of explains the EPL paradox result. If we assume there is hidden variable. Okay, yeah. Uh, you, you, you can, I, I think uh, you can construct even with more electron. I, I'm not uh, into this, but uh, I think you can still use this one to keep proving that you can uh, have the, uh, if you can explain the EPR paradox with more and more hidden variable. Okay. But however, what happened to this Nobel Prize or this Bell's inequality? Basically, it is that the Bell's theorem say that quantum mechanics is incompatible with the local hidden variable theorem. Just now, I use local hidden variable to explain the EPL paradox. But however, you cannot explain everything in quantum mechanics. And one of them is the so-called uh, the violation of Bell inequality. So we are going to show that there's something called Bell inequality. This inequality is correct 
if you have the local hidden fear, uh, variable here, fear, like what we are talking about, you will get this inequality. But we will show that in quantum mechanics, you actually is going to violate the bell inequality. Okay. Now that is the theorem, right? In theory, I'm going to show you that indeed it violates because we have the theory. But you need to prove it experimentally. And that is what this Nobel Prize is about. They have conducted different types of experiments to show that the Bell inequality is violated. And thus, Bell's theorem is correct. And thus, local hidden variable theorem or this low hidden variable explanation is wrong, incomplete. So basically it brings us back, we still don't know why we have this EPR paradox. We only show that this is wrong. Then maybe the, you can transmit signal faster than the speed of light, or you need to further discuss philosophically or come up with a new uh, uh, theory, okay? So in summary, that is what about the Bell's theorem. And the Nobel Prize is about they did the experimental work to prove that Bell's theorem is correct. And Bell's theorem says that the Bell's inequality is violated in quantum mechanics. Okay, so this is a summary. I hope that you can relate to it. And actually, I said something wrong in my previous lecture because I did not prepare. I keep saying that the Bell's equality, inequality is maintained. It's opposite. It's violated. Okay, if you watch that video. Okay, but we have learned enough basic stuff that enable us to really look into this theorem. Use some example. People usually use the photonics uh, Qubit as an example to explain the Bell inequality. There are many different types of Bell inequality, but we just take one example, one concrete example. And I find this Wikipedia's example is easier to understand for us because it's shorter, but uh, maybe not easier to understand, but mathematically it is easier, easier to, to, to do the calculation and in from the cases. Okay, so we'll look at this. Now, let's say for that two electron, right? We can either measure the electron one in zero or one basis. I call it A0 measurement, okay? This measurement called A0. It just means that I put the magnetic field in the Z direction, right? And then I measure the energy. Then I know that whether it's spin up or spin down. That is zero and one. I can also measure in the plus minus basis corresponding to the putting magnetic field in the x direction. I call it A1 measurement. This is going to give me plus or minus. Again, spin left, spin right, same eigen energy. Is this okay? The first electron on the earth. I can perform either A0 or A1 measurement. I can set up the magnetic field up or horizontally and measure is how it collapses, measure the energy of the electron spin in the magnetic field. Okay? Now, for B, which is far away, it can also choose to measure at B0 and B1. But look at this. B0 and B1 are not the same as A0 and A1. Just in order to prove it, use this, demonstrate this theory, B0 is said to be X plus Z divided by square root 2. So, it, negative. So, it's in this 45 degree, in this direction. This is a 2D plane. And then B1 is said to be X minus Z, so it is here in this direction, right? Then of course, of course, this is 90 degree, and this is also 90 degree, and this is 45 degree, right? Nothing special, you just think that my friend, 109 years away, just rotate their magnetic field in that direction when they perform the measurement. And then they will get spin, I don't, want to, don't know what to say, spin up and down, but not really up and down, but along this axis, right? Spin here or spin other axis. Is that okay? So, then we are going to do a lot of measurement. 
you are going to get the result a0 small a0 small a1 small a b small uh, small b0 small b1 and when you measure you you could get either one or zero right because this is eigenvalue right you will get either one or zero now if i do a lots of measurement i do a lots of more measurement and i randomly select the orientation well for example i, I don't talk to my friend because we are far away I just use dice, I randomly say, oh, this time I want to do A0, right? Then I may get A0, and then my friend may happen to do B0 direction, right? And next time maybe I want to do A1, but my friend is doing B1 it randomly, right? You don't know which one we choose, right? We only have four possible combinations, A0, uh, B0, A0, B1, A1, B0, A1, B1, right? And then you just find out the lump, the value you measure. You will get either one or minus one in each of these terms. And I decided to come up with an expression. This is just a makeup expression. I want to find the average value of this expression. Okay? Just an expression I want to calculate. It doesn't have any physical meaning. I just say that, okay, I want to average all the measurements that we get. Based on this, you see this one I can factorize. If the, the best case, if you only have a, pos, a few possible results for each of these four combinations. Let's say I have 100 measurement, then I have 25 of this combination because I would just put four of them together. And because I do it with a lot of simul a lot of measuring randomly on average, I should have 25 of this combination. Then a0 plus A1, it can be either they are the same, then this becomes 2, right? And A0 minus A1, if they are the same, then this one becomes 0. And this can be either 1 or minus 1. So no matter what, you always see that the result is either negative 2 or 2 when you just put them together. Then what is the average value of negative of 2? or two or negative two, right? You either have two or negative two and you do a bunch of measurement. It must be less than two, right? Because you may have two minus two, minus two, minus two, plus two. But on average, you need to be less than or equal to two. So basically, this is that, this one is a result of hidden variable. You will get this if you use hidden variable theorem, you naturally will say, I do all this measurement, I naturally will get on average less than two for this expression. Again, this expression has no special physical meaning. Just superficially, you don't see any physical meaning. We construct this to show the Bell's inequality. And this is the so-called Bell's inequality in this case. Okay, so with hidden variable, the average value of this must be less or equal to zero. And now, from quantum mechanics, from we will be able to prove that now the electron will try to make in an entangled pair. We decided to do that. And then we can show that this FH value is 2 times square root 2, which is larger than 2. So as a result, Bell's inequality is wrong. And thus, hidden variable explanation is wrong. This is theory. But what they did is they experimentally proved that, not this one, but the photonics one, or many other different experiments, they proved that Bell's inequality is well later. And that's why you cannot explain quantum mechanics by saying that there has hidden variable inside quantum mechanics. Although we still don't know why, but it's not because there's hidden variable. Is that okay? So I hope to bring this to you, but this is a good exercise for us to practice our math. Right? So I would like to show how to calculate this one from, from now on. Right? So let's do some practice. First of all, we said that A Zero measurement is in the C direction. What is the operator? Corresponding operator. 
relatively in the C, huh? Sigma C, very good. Sigma C equals to one zero zero negative one. And again, we discussed all this poly matrix right in this uh, link already. How about A one? Is in the x direction. Sigma x, very good. Which is zero one one zero, right? Now, what is the matrix for B0 then? Do you remember how to find it? This becomes finding the operator the, uh, of, of the spin matrix, right? The spin matrix in a direction corresponding the, to the real 3D space direction here, right? Do you remember how to find that, the equation? Do you remember the equation? This one. Does it ring the bell? N is the univector in the 3D space signify the direction of the magnetic field. And sigma is the vector or the poly vector. Remember that? Basically, if I look at this one, this direction. What is the direction in the real 3D space? It is one over, one over square root two for X, zero for Y, one over square root two for Z, right? That is the univector in this direction. Actually, I make a mistake, it needs to be negative do you agree this is the negative x minus z univector this is x z right this is x right so this is negative x this is negative c so this is negative x plus negative c make sense And what is the sigma vector? Do you remember? Sigma x, sigma y, sigma z. Okay, so you do the plot product, what you get is 1 over square root 2, negative, sigma x. Plus sigma z. So, we learned this before. I think we did that in assignment one. You should be able to construct the matrix easily. But if you forgot, fair enough, it's not simple. But you know that you know how to do it already, right? How about B1? B1, I'm not going to go through the derivation, but you can find that it is just sigma x minus sigma c divided by square root two. But let's put this into the matrix. What is this matrix? What is sigma x plus sigma c? What is sigma x plus sigma c? Yeah, just a0 plus a1, right? Sigma, what is that? 1, 1, 1, negative 1, right? You just add these two together. How about this one? What is sigma x minus sigma c? Sigma x minus 1, because 0 minus 1, yeah? And then 1, 1, 1. Is that okay? Say again. One negative one over root two. This is that's right, yeah. Because B one is in this direction, is x minus z, right? Okay. So we can construct the matrix, right? So after constructing the matrix, then we want to understand okay. 
how to do the calculation. So my goal, right? My goal is to calculate the this. What is the meaning of this then? A zero tensor product B zero, right? What is the meaning of this? A zero is the operator tensor product B zero because we have two electrons. A zero is for the first electron, B zero is for the second electron. And you do the tensor product, it becomes the operator for the two qubit system. Okay? But what is the meaning of this bracket? It's just a simplification. It means we put, what do we do? We put psi minus to it. And then now I, I'm not going to write down the tensor product symbol to make it simple. That's what it means. Do you remember in assignment one, I asked you to find the FH value of the sigma X or sigma Z, remember? Of a given state, right? The FH value, the FH measurement value is just the operator sandwiched by the bra and cat of the state. That signifies what is the FH value I will measure under this operator. So the first thing I need to do is find out what is A0 tensor product B0. This is not difficult. How do you do it? A0 is 100 zero, negative zero, 1 from the last page. Tensor product B0. B0 is a little bit more complicated, but we calculated it already. It is negative 1 over square root 2, 1, 1, 1, negative 1. Right, I just show you. This is the B0, 1 over square root 2, 1, 1, negative 1, and A0 is just 1, 0, negative 1. How do you find the tensor product of two operator? Yeah, 1 times 1, 1, 1, minus 1, 0 times 1, 1, 1, minus 1, 0 times 1, 1, 1 minus 1, 1 times negative 1 times 1, 1, 1 minus 1, right? So the whole thing, I'm um, run running out of space. I will just write it as negative 1 over square root 2. 1, 1, 1, negative 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. Negative 1, negative 1, negative 1. And then 1. Here I have a typo. This one is negative 1. Is this okay? Yeah, that's how you do the tensor product. Now with this, then I just do a regular multiplication. But before that, I can just uh, do the exercise a little bit more. Remind ourselves. How do you write the psi in a column form? Psi minus in column form. But maybe you forgot what is psi, right? The psi I gave you is 1 over square root 2, 0, 1, minus 1, 0. How do you write in column form? What is that? Okay, do not forget this uh, 1 over square root 2 is 0, 1, minus 1, 0. Why? Because again, this signifies how much 0, 0 you have, how much 0, 1 you have, how much 1, 0 you have, how much 1, 1 you have for this state. Okay? So how about the bra version of psi minus? What do you do? Becomes a row vector, right? And I don't need to take the compressed conjugate because this has all real coefficients, right? So the FH is easy. It's just A0 for tensor product B0 FH on this state, right? It's psi, so it is 1 over square root 2, 0, 1, negative 1, 0. Then you multiply the whole thing, negative 1 over 2, the whole matrix, 1, 1, 0, 0, 1, negative 1, 0, 0. 
zero zero negative one negative one zero zero negative one one times one over square root two very long zero one zero one zero right so what i'm doing is this this one equals to this one right because we're calculating the average value of this given state when measured by this operator right so that's why the bra version I put here, so here I have a typo. This one should not be this. This is the bra version of this one. And I put A0, tensor product B0, which is here. And then I put the psi minus the cat version. And then I just do matrix multiplication. And you will see that this equals to one over square root two. Any questions? Can you explain the top line? Which top line? This nine? Yeah. This nine, this is just an abbreviation. It means what is the average value of this operator, which is meaningless, because you need to say the average value for a given state. And the reason I dare try to write this because we assume that the given state is this state already. Okay? So this nine is just, I spell it, out, I say it is the average value of psi minus. So we would bracket psi minus uh, on the operator. Yeah, because I want to find the average value you will measure for this psi minus state. Okay. If you forgot, let me remind you again, right? What is the average value you will get for the one state when you do sigma c measurement okay for example so if my state is at one what is the average value you will measure when you do a measurement at state one what do you get there is a state if state is at one when you do measurement what would you be what, what will you be huh The state is a state one. When you do measurement, what would it be? I asked the girl, do you like me? She, she said, no. And I keep asking, what do I get? No, right? So it is a state one. I keep measuring, what do you get? One. Correct? If you have a linear conversion of zero plus one, you do measure, you can collapse to either zero or one. Now it is at one, you do the measurement, it collapses to one forever, right? So what value is it? What's the eigenvalue when the state is one? What's the eigenvalue when the state is zero? Not eigenvalue, I mean the, yeah, the corresponding eigenvalue. Yeah, plus one for zero, right? So, so it should be minus one, right? When I keep measuring one, right? So how can I find it? If I do this. This must be negative one. Because no matter how many times you measure, I must get negative one. This is the average value I will get. But in general, you might not get, might not have one, right? You have alpha, beta, right? And this is easy to prove because one is zero, one. Sigma C is one, zero, zero, negative one. And this is one, uh, this is zero, one because it is one, right? So what do you get? You do the multiplication, you get zero, negative one. And then you do one more multiplication, you get one, right? Negative one, right? Just to show that a, a special case, yeah, this one gives me the average value. But if you have alpha beta, it's not zero, one, then you will get the alpha beta. That is what we had in the assignment, isn't there? Alpha squared plus beta, minus beta squared. Do you do it yourself? Yeah. Remember? Remember I asked you what is the average value you will get in sigma c and I asked you to think from the classical point, prob probabilistic point, and then use the, use the equation 
right? So this one is the average value you will get for this operator for a given state. That's why I write in this way. Okay? Now, then I will not do the rest. You need to do at the other computation yourself. Maybe we can put it in the meter. Right? And then you will find that A0 tensor product B plus A0 tensor product B1 plus A1 tensor product B0 minus A1 tensor product B what is that? B1. Right? This is equals to 2 square root 2, which is larger than 2. So here I show you that in quantum mechanics, you are allowed to prepare an entangled pair. And then you find that the probability, I mean, the average value of this expression is 2 square root 2 which is larger than the two given the boundary given that the bell inequality based on hidden variable. That's why the hidden variable theorem is wrong, cannot explain, right? The theory show that that's okay, but if the theory is wrong, of course you get wrong stuff, right? But they did the experiment they show that indeed Bell's inequality is violated. And thus, we cannot explain quantum mechanics in the uh, using hidden variable. Yes. Yeah.